Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It is the 21st of March, 2021. As always, if this is useful, a like, subscribe, comment, and share is appreciated. This week, in terms of new videos, uh, I posted a, a very deep dive all about Azure AD Privileged Identity Management, thinking about that just-in-time elevation for Azure AD roles, Azure roles, and even group memberships, and those groups might have various roles assigned to them. And then a lot of people have kind of asked questions around, well, there's different types of storage account, there's different types of storage services, there's different sort of performance tiers. What does all that mean? So I kind of just quickly went through that in that storage video. And then also I just posted a little um, building discipline mentoring video that I don't ever show here. So maybe elephant in the room, obviously there was an Azure AD outage on the 15th of March, which then had kind of this cascading effect on other services. Now, I'm not gonna go into a ton of detail about that here. They have posted kind of the root cause analysis now, and I would kind of recommend you just kind of um, go and read that for yourselves. But it does go ahead and talk through, well, hey, if you go and look at that article, then we can say, hey, look, the summary of the impact, yes, it was kind of Azure AD, then it impacted those other services. And what it's really talking about in this article is fundamentally there's metadata about the keys that are used to sign the various tokens. And one of those keys was being used for an extended amount of time and was marked as such. But there was an automation that actually when cleaned up that key from the metadata um, early, well, that metadata is then published out to a central point that gets read in and cached by all the other services. Well, so when it incorrectly removed the reference to the key, now those services wouldn't trust the tokens anymore that were signed with the key. Well, those services then actually cache that metadata for various amounts of time. So even after Azure AD went back and rewound that metadata, so it did include that key, well, those services now had a cache of the metadata without the key. So then they actually had to go and maybe just automatically refreshed after a period of time, or maybe there was some action required. So that's why there were the kind of these various delays for services, and the article goes through all of that. Now, one of the common things people then always ask is, well, what can I do to kind of help protect myself against if there were Azure AD impacts? And there's an article here it talks about some of the resiliency you can actually do for services. It talks about things like, well, hey, yeah, I can use managed identities. I can do things like reducing the authentication calls, those long-lived tokens, uh, continual, continual access evaluation. There are things you can do, but obviously there's just a certain reliance on Azure AD, and that's saying Microsoft, again, in that root cause analysis, they go into details about these new safe deployment practices that they're in this phase two that will actually protect against this happening in the future. Of course, 1st of April, we have a new 4.9s SLA. So there were things happening to improve the resiliency of Azure AD, and that's kind of something that, that's kind of ongoing. But again, if you're, you're after the detail, you should read the root cause analysis. That really goes through exactly what happened. So on to uh, happier things. So the AMD Confidential Computing is now in limited preview. Now you've probably heard talk of kind of the um, confidential computing before with the Intel and the SGX with those secure enclaves. And that was really an app level kind of secure enclave. The memory for the app was protected, it was resilient and against other things. Well, this is different. This is now thinking about it at an entire virtual machine level. So these are using these third gen AMD Epic processors, the 7003 series. And what now it does is the CPU itself generates these keys that are used to encrypt the memory of the entire virtual machine. So I don't have to do anything. I don't change anything in my application. I now just get this entire VM memory is encrypted using a key that never leaves the CPU. So the entire virtual machine is encrypted. So this is actually pretty in exciting stuff at runtime that vm has the encryption there's nothing i have to do to change my application to just leverage that so i now will start to have choices hey i can use these technologies to encrypt the entire vm 
I can still use those Intel SGX technologies to just encrypt at the app level. I think that's the DC series virtual machine. So we just have these new capabilities. Um, the Azure App Service now has these Apex domain support. So the Apex domain is where we think about the top level, the root. So something like savultech.net. Ordinarily, we're used to having certificates that have some child element, www.savultech.net. And App Services always had the ability to give us kind of these managed certificates that they give out for six months and they auto renew if we're using custom domains. Well, now, instead of only being able to do those kind of child domains like www, whatever that might be, it can now actually give out certificates for the root domain, that apex domain. Like now, I could have a cert for just savultech.net. So now I have that capability in preview. And I mentioned a second ago these new AMD uh, Epic 3rd Gen 7003 series. Well, there's now actually a new HBV3 series virtual machines in GA in certain regions. And these are actually using those same AMD Epic processors. Now, these are designed for huge high performance compute scenarios. And if we actually go and look at these, we can see, hey, look, there's, there's a bunch of different ones about these. But what you'll notice, it's kind of interesting here, is they all have the same processor and the amount of memory and the amount of bandwidth and the same 200 gigabit per second RDMA network adapters. The only thing that's different about them is the number of virtual CPUs. And this is actually using um, constrained CPUs. So there's really one SKU and one price, these kind of 120. But let's say, for example, I have certain workloads running inside, maybe it's per CPU licensing, and I want to hide some of those processes. Well, then I can use these CPU constrained versions. We can kind of see this, hey, dash 96, dash 64, 32. So you won't see the same number of CPU cores, but I've still got all the same memory and bandwidth for network high performance. But hey, I, I can actually hide some of those CPUs that so maybe changes the licensing of the software running inside it. So now those are available in certain regions. On the storage side, so Azure Storage Explorer v1.18.0 was released, but already, uh, I updated this yesterday, I actually got the .18.1 was installed. Because um, this will just auto update for you. This is kind of the tool for Azure Storage. It's really got some improvements around the connectivity experience using shared access signatures now with ADLS Gen 2. There's better log naming, uh, just an overall start, stop, and it now uses the new AZ Copy 10.8 to improve the overall copy performance. Insights for SQL Server is now in preview. Now, this is for Azure SQL Database, Azure SQL Managed Instance, and SQL Server on virtual machines. There's a little bit more to it than kind of the average insights. In insights, normally we just kind of click a button and it starts writing stuff to log analytics, and then we get these insights. Well, for this solution, what I, I kind of have to do is I'll, I'll see it over there in Azure Monitor, so I can go, for example, to Monitor. And I'll see, notice I have this SQL preview. And I can go and select that. But then there's multiple things I have to do. I have to go and actually create a profile, a monitoring profile, for the types of things that I'm actually going to go and capture the frequencies. Then what I need to then do is create, within each of the databases, a user account that has the certain permissions and then I have to create a virtual machine that will be kind of this monitoring hub. And then that will use those accounts to go and capture the data. And then I'll get these fantastic insights. So it's a little bit more involved than maybe what we're used to for common insights. But this is going to give us fantastic insights to everything going on within all those different types of SQL environment. Um, Long-term data retention for Azure SQL Managed Instance backups is now in preview. We're used to the idea normally we would get 35 days. Well, now with this feature, it's actually going to take these and copy it to Blob, and I can set a retention for the weeklies, the monthly, and the annual. So I'm going to be able to do that long-term retention uh, by copying that over to my Blob storage. 
we now have these dynamic data masking granular permissions. So remember, data masking is not about a different level of encryption. It's about when I look at the data, instead of seeing the full data, maybe it's just all X's, or maybe I all X everything apart from the last few digits, like a social security number. And what this is now gonna let me do is at very different levels, I could have this, for example, now at the schema level, at the table level, um, even column levels, I can have these different rules for actually how I want to mask the data and the permissions for who can unmask, hey, this column or this schema or this table. So again, it's not about encryption, it's about hiding it based on some function and then I can mask, unmask the data. Uh, machine learning on Azure SQL Managed Instance is now GA. So last week we kind of talked about Azure Arc now has a machine learning capability for Arc that enables me to do things like training, maybe data preparation, optimization of the data, where the data is. I don't have to move it to somewhere else. So now with Azure SQL Managed Instance, we have that same local machine learning capability. AWS Gen 2 now has directory scoped shared access signatures. So remember, shared access signature, rather than just using like a storage access key, which gives me everything, I can scope to certain permissions on a certain scope. So now what it's saying is I can actually create one scoped to a particular directory. So if we jump over super quickly, and if I was to just go and look, so remember this is for ADLS Gen 2, so I would look at maybe all my storage accounts, and I would find one that is an ADLS, so the one over here. I would look at my containers. I would see there, hey, yep, yeah, I've got a container. And then I have folders. So with this feature, notice I can now click, and I have the option to generate a shared access signature actually now at the directory level. So for ADLS Gen 2, we now have the directory level SAS capability. So that's kind of a nice new feature to be able to control more granularly what I can do in the data lake. Miscellaneous. So Azure AD Domain Services actually got a number of updates. Remember, the whole point of the Azure AD Domain Services is ordinarily we think, great, we have Azure AD. And our Azure AD is called AD, but it's really not AD. I speak things like OAuth, I speak OpenID Connect, I speak SAML and WSFed, I speak those things. Well then I've got some application running in my virtual network, and well my app wants to be able to talk maybe Kerberos or LDAP or NTLM, which this can't talk. Now regular AD talks all those things, but maybe I don't have access to it, or maybe I, I don't even have that there, I don't have an AD. And so what Azure AD Domain Services does is it basically creates a managed Active Directory of a couple of domain controllers that is projected into a dedicated Azure AD Domain Services subnet. Now historically, and then obviously what that does is, so it actually does kind of a, a sync that way, so I have the same passwords here as I would have here. And then I can speak Kerberos and LDAP and NTLM to that. Now that's great, but historically I could only have that in one region. I couldn't have another deployment to another region. So what they've introduced now is I can have replica sets. So I can have multi-region support. So now what I could actually have, imagine that was one region, so that was kind of region one. Well now I can have another region, region two, where I have a different VNet, now I can have another Azure AD Domain Services replica. I can have four in total, so that's one, two, three, four. That will project again into another, those managed domain controllers project into another subnet. Now what's actually happening is, if you know Active Directory, there's a concept of sites, which are kind of groups of domain controllers that replicate directly sort of straight away. All of these are in one big site. There are not separate sites for these. So it's gonna use the Active Directory replication. 
And also I have to have network connectivity. There has to be an IP path between these subnets. So I have to kind of peer these virtual networks or I'm doing something so there is an IP path between them. I have to have that because what's actually happening is they're using replication. If I had another virtual network over here with another Azure AD, the third replica set, well, these all have to, it has to be a mesh, mesh network. All the DCs have to be able to talk to all of those DCs. So I can now deploy in up to four regions my Azure AD domain services, but they all have to be able to talk because it's using that AD replication now behind the scenes to populate and it's all one site. So there's no delay like I would normally get over site links. It's just gonna, hey, a change has been made, tell, shout out to everyone, which is why I need kind of this mesh full routing capability. So that is now there. There were some new attributes being replicated, um, company name, manager, and employee ID, and they're replicated from Azure AD to there. And they also added the idea of a managed resource forest. Now the whole point of this is, as I kind of drew here, normally with the Azure AD domain services, this is a user forest. It's doing a replication from Azure AD with the password hashes into here. Maybe I don't want that, but maybe I still need a local Azure AD for my application so it can talk. And so the resource forest idea is there's no sync from this Azure AD, but it creates a managed resource forest, which you then establish a one-way trust to your on-prem AD, so we can then still authenticate against these accounts but I have that local AD that resources can talk to. So that resource forest is now available to me. Um, Azure budget forecast alerts are now in GA. So if we actually go and look at this, this is actually pretty cool. So ordinarily, a budget is all about, well, hey, alert me when I've spent this amount of money. This is now letting me say, well, actually, alert me if my current trend is such that I'm going to spend a certain amount of money. So I've got a budget over here, and if I edit this budget, you can see for my alert, so I've got a budget of $125, I'm very, very cheap. You can kind of see hey, where, where it's going. But notice here now, under my type, I have this actual, I've already got a forecasted, but this is set to forecasted. So what I've said here, hey, look, if based on where I'm going, I'm going to end up with, I'm actually doing it greater than my budget. If I'm going to be 120% of my budget, which in this case, because my budget was set to what, 125, it's saying is 150, perform this action. So now my budget alerts don't have to only be what I have spent. It will look at the trending that's happening and now actually alert me based on, hey, this is the direction you're heading, so maybe I can start taking action a lot sooner. Hey, look, you're gonna break your budget. You're at 50% maybe, but I'm forecasting you're gonna end up way above. So if I'm forecasting at a certain, maybe 120%, 150%, tell me now so I can actually start performing actions. So that's actually a very cool capability. There are some new PCI DSS certifications for now all of the live regions, there's a whole set of new documents. You can go and click on the Trust Center and you can actually go ahead and download all of those. I guess I'm gonna show it super quick. I put the link in for a reason. If I click it long enough, there we go. So again, if I jump over, you can see all of the different reports. So if I scroll over to PCI DSS, you see there's this new package of documents that has all of the various attestations, um, all of those different things you would likely care about. So those are available. And finally now, uh, Brazil South has availability zones in GA. So obviously they're super useful, separate calling, power communications, I can now leverage. So that was it um, for another week. Uh, I hope that was useful and until next week, Take care.